Hello, I'm Peter Best. Welcome to Meet the Expert, the series of podcasts on swine health management in practice brought to you by Beringer Incline. A central part of health management strategies on the swine breeding unit is to prepare new gilts correctly for their introduction to the herd. It's something on which I reckon we'd all benefit from a refresher course covering the latest information. So I'm pleased to say that in this episode of Meet the Expert, we're talking to someone in the United States with considerable expertise in this area. He is Dr. Clayton Johnson. Dr. Johnson received his veterinary medicine doctorate from the University of Illinois in 2008. That was followed by his appointment by the Mashoff's Hog Production Company in the States as their Director of Health and Animal Care. And then about four years ago, he switched to being veterinarian partner and Director of Health at Carthage Veterinary Services where his position as Director of Health means he works with clients globally on practical approaches to preparing gilts. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. I imagine your work with Carthage Veterinary Services takes you to large sound networks in various countries, does it? It does, Peter. Um, certainly 2020 and, and 2021 to date have made international travel a challenge. But it doesn't mean that we can't interact globally. Um, No different than you and I sit uh, thousands of kilometers apart and are able to have a discussion about guilt development, guilt acclimation, and ultimately successful pig farming. We can do that same thing with our producers throughout the world today. Uh, Historically, I've spent a lot of time in China and Southeast Asia, and then certainly in North America as well. And one of the things you'll find with guilt development is the challenges are the same everywhere in the world, regardless of where you're trying to help producers. Mm. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you about preparing gilts, not least in those large pork production networks, which can run to hundreds of thousands of sales sometimes. But first, can you clear up something for me? Some people talk about this as being gilt introduction, acclimation, acclimatization. Others use different names. Which term do you prefer? Yeah, we we certainly have an industry full of jargon, um, and that can make it very difficult for folks that are coming into our industry. It's something I always remind myself when we have new technicians on the farm, new folks that uh, haven't been around pig farms. We've got an entire language that we have to we have to train them on so that they understand just the jargon we're talking about. I don't know if there's an agreed upon term, Peter, to to describe the process of introducing gilts into the farm, making sure that they are exposed to the resident pathogens and ultimately become immunocompetent to those pathogens prior to having their first litter. Um, I, I think that you'll hear the term acclimation used, you'll hear the term acclimatization used, you'll hear the terms guilt development and guilt introductions used a lot. And I really think that all of those terms need to work together for a successful guilt production within your farm. Um, You know, I do kind of divide the terms guilt development and guilt acclimation or guilt acclimatization into two different categories, Peter. And when I think of guilt development, I'm really thinking about preparing that animal for the reproductive future that she has ahead of her. I'm thinking specifically on the physiology and biology of reproduction and make sure that we are optimizing the preparation of that guilt for her reproductive performance. Now, when I shift into the acclimation or the acclimatization area, Peter, I really don't, uh, I don't think about that the same way in terms of arming her for reproductive success. I'm trying to arm her immune system for success within the population that we're placing her in. You know, by definition, the term introduction suggests that you're moving from one area to another. And a lot of times I'll make an analogy with folks on the farm about our own visits to a new country or to a new region. Um, you know, we have to adjust to a new environment, to a new ecosystem when we go somewhere. I'm sure all of us have went on vacation somewhere and maybe had an upset stomach soon after we arrived at that location. Uh, Differences in water, differences in food, differences in the local environment. It just takes our bodies a little while to adjust and certainly gilts have to go through that same thing. 
We've also got to understand that pathogen exposure is likely going to happen on our farms when we bring in new gilts into it. If we're rearing our own gilts, well, they're exposed to the pathogens of the farm and the farrowing crate. But if we're bringing in new gilts into our operation at any age, they're going to see a new set of endemic pathogens. Uh, and by endemic pathogens, I mean pathogens that infect pigs throughout the world. Pathogens that don't necessarily cause disease in every situation, but they will cause infection. And we don't have good enough diagnostics today, Peter, to really sort out and say, you know, is this strep going to be an issue for a new introduction? Is this Haemophilus parasuus? Is this Actinobacillus suis or, or, or APP or influenza? We struggle sometimes to understand how the impact um, will be of those new introductions to our resident pathogens. But regardless of what that impact is, it's very important that we are strategic about making sure that the pathogen exposure occurs early enough in that guilt's life so that she recovers from the infection, stops shedding that particular pathogen, and is immunocompetent at the time of farrowing. She can share her immune system, her competent immune system with her piglets through the passive transfer of colostrum. And to me, that's really the core of acclimation or acclimatization, regardless of which term you want to use. No, I'll use development and acclimation quite happily, thanks, and I'll take your point on both of those. Uh, to be clear, on, in this conversation, we're talking principally about a sow system that brings in naive or pathogen-negative gilts from a known source as several batches per year. That's really what our focus will be mm -hmm. uh, as far as this conversation is concerned. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's appropriate. That's certainly where the most focus needs to be on your guilt acclimation program because you know you've got to restart that guilt immune system to make sure she's comfortable with all the pathogens in your herd. How many of those introductions of a batch of gilts are there going to be a year? Do you advise keeping the number down if possible? Well, there's two things we think about there, Peter. Um, one is simply the, uh, the introductions themselves and the need to get good acclimation done. The other is the biosecurity risk or the disease introduction risk going the other way, where the gilts coming into our farms, our resident farms, are a risk to bring a new pathogen with them. We do like to decrease the introductions for that biosecurity risk. The less number of new animal introductions, the less we reduce, uh, pardon me, the greater we reduce the risk that those animal introductions. I typically find, Peter, that a happy medium is right around one introduction every four weeks. Some producers like to stretch that out. Some producers can be very successful with one introduction every eight weeks. But I think somewhere in between there is probably the most appropriate time to find the balance between limiting your biosecurity risk from animal introductions and still at the same time having a steady flow of gilts into your operation. Yeah, I have to confess actually, uh, with gilt introduction, I could never quite decide if, if the main health objective is to protect the gilt from the sow herd or the sow herd from the gilt. I mean, I was rereading the other day a, a sow management guide from 40 years ago, and its focus was entirely on protecting the herd, insisting in fact, that the introduction of any new pigs from an outside source was the single biggest potential threat to herd health. And uh, I, I guess we moved on from there over 40 years, but it, it cuts both ways, doesn't it? The, the health of the guilt and the health of the herd. It does. And I would tell you that um, the new introductions are still absolutely, if not the biggest risk to the health of your herd, they're one of the biggest risks. You know, and I think where we've improved in the last 40 years, Peter, on introducing guilt successfully and safely while still protecting the health of our herd is primarily in the health of the multiplication systems that we all work with. So we have really done a nice job of making those uh, multiplication systems and those genetic systems pathogen free as best we can, at least for the, the major pathogens of concern, the, the, the PERS viruses, the mycoplasmas, the PED, and all of the various different uh, enteric coronaviruses we deal with. 
We've done a great job of cleaning up the health of those herds. We've also come a long way with diagnostic monitoring, Peter. You know, 40 years ago, we didn't have the ability to do testing and verify those animals were uh, a low risk introduction. Um, we just, and, and we often didn't have isolation facilities to move those animals into. So we've come a long way with cleaning up the health of the upstream herds. We've improved the diagnostic testing to validate our assumptions on the health status of those animals. And we've built infrastructure, things like isolation buildings that can help us to quarantine those incoming animals, test them again to get another validation after shipment that they are healthy before we introduce them in the herd. And that has ultimately led us to much be much better risk managers when it comes to those introductions. But make no mistake about it, if we don't manage that risk effectively, the risk is still there. And if you bring in a new pathogen with your guilt, the consequences will still be tremendous to your operation. I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to talk again about testing and validation in some detail, if you will, because that's an interesting thing you say there, how often you need to test, what are you doing to test, and so on. But before that, uh, a general question. Uh, how then should we today evaluate whether we're preparing our guilts correctly? What's, what's the measurement we should use? Yeah. Well, the nice thing with pig production, Peter, is the, the pig doesn't lie. Um, everything in pig production can fib to me except for the pig. You look at the pig and particularly you evaluate that pig's performance. The pig will tell you if things are going well. The pigs will tell you if you're doing the right things to manage it. If the pig's giving you feedback through its production, through its performance, that things aren't going well, you have to listen to that. Even if you think you're implementing everything in the, the production SOP perfectly, there's something missing there. You know, the, the controllers that manage the environment of the room, they may have some data issues, right? They may not have a probe that's working right. They may have some inaccuracy in their electrical systems. Those things can give me bad information, but if the pig tells me something's going wrong, there's a problem. If I do those diagnostic tests, Peter, on incoming gilts, and say maybe I'm testing for PED, a very important disease, and the diagnostic tests come back negative, but the pigs have a very bad case of diarrhea, I still don't want to bring those pigs into my herd, right? There's still a risk. The pigs are telling me they're sick. I need to listen to the pigs. And when I think about guilt development and gill acclimation, Peter, I'm really looking at the performance within my guilt developer. So what's my mortality levels for the guilt, growing guilt period? What's my growth levels? How effective are my gilts growing during this period of time? We want optimal growth on those gilts so that they are at the right weight at the right time to breed. I'm going to look at the you percentage. Some bench, sorry, could you offer a benchmark of growth, please? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, um, and I'll apologize. Uh, it'll take me a second to do my pounds to kilograms translation. No, you do kilograms or pounds. We're, our listeners are very versed in everything. They're, they're much more knowledgeable than I am. So you go pounds. There's no problem. Yeah, so I think we really want to target at least a, a pound and a half per day of gain on those gilts. That would I, that's what I would say would be kind of a minimum expectation there, uh, 1.5 pounds. Start, starting from when to when, sorry, that pound and a half, which uh, as you know equates to well under a kilo, uh, uh, how starting at what point to what point would that grow? Yeah, I would say be? that would be from weaning time, Peter, all the way up until we select those animals, and that's generally a period of about three weeks of age to 20 weeks of age. Okay, and are there other performance data that would help us do an evaluation of our guilt preparation uh, as opposed to the health of the animal and whether or not it's sick? Uh, you know, are there other things that you l look at in your advisory capacity that tells you, look, we've got to check how the guilts are being prepared? Yeah, the next thing I'm going to look at, Peter, is the percentage of guilts that are coming into heat by 30 weeks of age. And the 30 weeks of age number needs to be adjusted based on the specific genetics that you have in your farm. Some animals will come into heat naturally younger than others. So when I say 30 weeks of age, I'm really talking about um, you know modern genetics that I would work with that are commercial gilts. They're meant for commercial farms. If you're looking at purebred animals, you absolutely need to extend that out to 32, 33, 34 weeks of age. Those animals will be older when they come into heat and certainly some different genetic lines will be older when they come into heat. 
But I want to see Peter, you know, certainly 90 plus percent of those animals coming into heat by that time so that I feel good that we are setting them up for reproductive success and there's not some sort of a health drag that's preventing those animals from participating to the reproductive activities that we want to have on the sow farm. 90% is a high target. It is, uh, but I think it's very achievable, Peter. Um, and I would tell you the best producing systems are probably going to be higher than 90%. They'd be in the 90 to 95% range. Right. And, and, okay, so what is then the estrus, uh, you know, when the uh, guild is coming into heat and so on? Anything else? What about conception rate, uh, if I could offer that? Absolutely. Um, and even before conception rate, Peter, I would tell you I'm going to look at the farm's weekly number of gilt breeds. We really try and be as consistent as we can on pig farms for the number of gilt breeds per week. And on targets there, Peter, we typically use about 1% of your mated inventory. So if you are a 5,000 sow farm, that means you want to breed about 50 sows, or pardon me, 50 gilts every single week. That would be your target number for breeds. And then from there, Peter, we definitely look at the conception rates on those gilts that we're breeding. We expect our gilt conception rates to be the best conception rates of any parity in the herd. It's critical that that's the case because we're going to breed more gilts as a percentage than any other parity in the herd. The gilts every week make up the biggest block from a single parity that contributes to our overall breeding performance. If our gilt conception rate's poor, simply put, our overall farm conception rate will be poor. And those gilts should be very, very fertile animals. So we really expect those gilt conception rates on a commercial farm that doesn't have a disease challenge to be in that 93, 94% area. Let me pause for a moment to remind everyone that more information on this conversation, like articles, publications, and videos, can be found on the website purs.com. Consistently over time, uh, you know, will you, how much variation in a year would you allow around that sort of thing? Should, can there be quite a variability of bell-shaped curves? Type? There is going to be some seasonality to it, Peter, uh, but I would tell you the seasonality is often driven by us and the decisions we make. And I specifically reference the summertime where we just have a hard time getting animals of, of all capacities on the farm to come into heat to demonstrate estrus in the, in the heat of the summer and early fall. And in those times, Peter, we're often uh, making breeding decisions that we wouldn't in other times of the year. Because we expect there to be poor conception rates on all parodies, we may breed some return animals, some opportunity animals, including gilts that maybe have previously been bred and not had a positive preg check or have returned or have had an abortion. Oftentimes we like to cycle those animals out of the farm, but during the summer months, we're in a situation where we really need every animal available to breed on just to make sure that we hit our breeding targets for those, those difficult months in the summer. So when I see that fluctuation, Peter, one of the first things I'm gonna look at is say within my gilt breeds, what percentage of conception rate do I have on the maiden gilts? the gilts that have never been bred before. Most of the year, that's almost everything I'm breeding on the gilt side, so I don't really need to split out the overall gilt conception rate into maiden gilts and opportunity or return gilts. But in the summertime, I'm definitely gonna ask that question. And if I see that we've just been breeding some extra gilts that we would normally cull to make sure we're hitting our targets and that those animals are predictably not having as good a conception rate as our maiden gilts, but our maiden gilt conception rate still looks good, I chalk that up to management decisions and I don't get terribly concerned about it. But if we see those maiden gilt conception rates dip, even in the, even in the summer, we're gonna get concerned about it. Okay, uh, before we go on then, Dr. Johnson, can I just take a moment to say to our listeners and viewers uh, thanks for joining us as you hear we're talking to Dr. Clayton Johnson from Carthage Veterinary Services in the United States about guilt acclimation. Dr. Johnson uh, you give me the impression that acclimation would therefore be to change the health status of our breeding guilts from susceptible to resistant if I could put it in that way. Uh, can we make that change in a general way, for example, for all the gilts in all herds, or is it a, a prescriptive approach according to what we have in the herd, and do we need specific protocols of acclimation against specific pathogens 
such as Marco, Plasma, and Perse? Great question, Peter. And I do think we have to get prescriptive for each herd. Not only do we have to lay out the specific targets for how we're going to expose each pathogen to the incoming gilts, but we also really need to focus in on different pathogens within different herds. Again, the pigs don't lie. If you need feedback on what pathogens are of most interest to your gilt development and acclimation program, look at your growing pig population, particularly in offspring that are coming from those gilt litters. What is their performance like? And if they have disease challenges, what are the greatest disease challenges you see present? We really need to focus in on those disease challenges with gilt development to make sure we minimize the future consequences of that. Now there are some general principles that I think everybody can use. You can, you can know that we've got to get them exposed early in life and recovered, but how we do that needs to be specific to each pathogen and each herd. Let's take the example of Myco. It happens to be one that I've seen in the past giving some problems because, you know, you can't get a uniform or consistent infection of these gilts by whatever you do, it seems to me. Myco is slow and takes a long time to do anything. Uh, can we start therefore with mycoplasma, right? So uh, you have a good knowledge of the health status of your herd, you know that mycoplasma is, is there, it probably will be, and you know it's not present in your gills. Okay, so let's say that you want to do something about that. Is natural exposure, for example, the way to go with mycoplasma or not? I think it depends, Peter, on when that natural exposure can occur. Um, and, and it also depends on, again, what's the, what's the downstream feedback that your growing pigs are giving you. If they're showing clinical signs of mycoplasma during the growing pig uh, period, it tells you your mycoplasma acclimation program is not yet sufficient at the gilt level. Um, we've come a long way with mycoplasma management in the last five to 10 years. I'm very fortunate to work with uh, Dr. Elise Tuhill on our team at Carthage Veterinary Services, who was really one of the first uh, pioneering veterinarians in the United States to look at an intentional exposure to mycoplasma. And Elise really uh, was one of the, the pioneers who came up with a system where we will harvest mycoplasma organisms, so actual mycoplasma bacteria from growing pigs and we will use that actual organism then to expose our incoming gilts on a regular basis. So those batches of gilts that come in will actually use a fogging machine to aerosolize that mycoplasma bacteria and we'll make some adjustments to the ventilation in the room when we do that to try and ensure that we do have good aerosol contact with that particular pathogen. I know we've all become experts on aerosol disease transmission with COVID here over the last 10 months, unfortunately. But the same principles for COVID work with mycoplasma in our pig population. If we can slow down the airspeed a little bit, create a nice human environment where that bacteria can stay viable in those aerosol droplets in the air, we'll have a nice transfer of mycoplasma to those pigs through direct exposure. The older your gilts are when you do that process, Peter, the more critical it is that you take an intentional step like that to infect all animals at the same time. Because to your point, mycoplasma is an insidious pathogen. It's a slow mover within a population. If you can start natural exposure to those gilts very early in life, you may be able to accomplish your goals and have them stop shedding by the time they farrow. But if you're talking about receiving these gilts any time past 10 weeks of age, I would really encourage you to explore intentional exposure to mycoplasma, specifically using uh, homogenates uh, that are aerosolized. It's been well researched, it's been well published. I mentioned my uh, partner, Dr. Tuhill, certainly Dr. Yeski and many others in the United States have become experts on how to accomplish this. And the, the recipe for how to get it done is out there if producers are considering that. Okay, who was it from a, a donor gilt or a, 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 an animal in the herd anyway, which you can then distribute to a group of, of gilts in the way you've described, using a fogging machine as it were. Uh, do you do this once or every day or for a month or what do you do? What's the right we way? Tip, typically, Peter will do it once to every batch of gilts as they are being introduced to the herd. 
most common in our system, Peter, the, mm -hmm. the Carthage system where we manage about 170,000 sows. We would bring in new gilts to the herd as wieners, so they would come in at three weeks of age. They would live in an isolation or quarantine barn for about the first eight weeks on average uh, that they're going to be coming in to, to our facility. So they would not be part of the main sow farm during that period. They'd be quarantined away. Then we would enter them into what we call the gilt developer, which is a part of the formal sow farm. They're, they're in the farm at that point. Um, and that, that moment would be when we would do that exposure, Peter. Every group would come in. It'd be about every four weeks in our system. So every four weeks we have a new batch of gilts that graduates from the isolation into the gilt developer. And upon that graduation, that's typically when we would do it. But if you can do it inside your isolation or quarantine area, there's certainly nothing to suggest that you can't do it there. And for some producers, the, the ventilation controls, the ability to get it done may actually be easier in that area. And as a general rule of thumb, the younger we can get that exposure accomplished, the better our acclimation will be. So in your example with the Carthage group, you're talking about what 11 week old pigs that you're, you're exposing in that way. What, in practice, what's the success rate of this procedure? I mean, is it uniformly successful or only in half the cases, or where is it? I would say, Peter, as long as you have a good homogenate, as long as you have a good positive source of donor material, your success rate is going to be very good. The Accomplishing it from that step is not very hard. The hard part is coming up with a good, consistent source of that donor material particularly on herds that have some other pathogen challenge. Because if you have another respiratory disease challenge, uh, maybe you have a, a circovirus problem on your farm, maybe you have uh, an APP problem or a PERS problem or an influenza problem, if you have some other pathogens that maybe you don't want to expose to the gilts at the same time, now you have to go through a pretty rigorous screening process on those donor samples and make sure you find some donor samples that have mycoplasma, they have the agent you're trying to expose to, but they're also negative for all those other pathogens that maybe you don't want wants to intentionally expose for whatever reason. I'm with you. Uh, no, I need to move on, but just quickly, is, is there any need to, for us today to talk about other forms of natural exposure? It seems to me they've been superseded. They've been almost individual animal level, not very reliable or controllable, mixing with cedar pigs and so on. Uh, is there a place for those in, uh, very quickly, Clayton, please? There is, um, and I would tell you, Peter, there's lots of producers that still get along very well with just using cedar animals. Those producers, if they have a secret sauce, it's that they're very consistent with it. They use young parity animals, preferably gilts, as their cedar animals. They don't use older parity cull sows that probably aren't shedding the pathogens of concern anymore. You know, you talked about susceptible to resistant. That parity 7, parity 8, parity 9 sow, she's probably resistant to all the pathogens of concern. She's probably not shedding mycoplasma anymore. So using her as your cedar animal is not good. But if you've got the right cedar animal chosen and you start the process young enough in that gilt's life, natural acclimation and natural exposure still has a place in our industry. But vaccination is the other thing I must talk to you about in this podcast, quite obviously. Uh, you know, where does vaccination fit in? Is it uh, preferable to natural exposure all the time or is it a mixture of the two? Absolutely a mixture of the two, um, Peter, you know, for mycoplasma in particular. Um, it kind of depends on the pathogen in terms of if you need both. Uh, some pathogens are, are so uh, virulent that maybe we don't want to do live exposure with the actual pathogen and we just want to do vaccination. And I would tell you PERS oftentimes is, is a, the best example I can use there where we would use a, a PERS vaccination program to acclimate our animals to PERS virus. But we would really try and avoid live virus inoculation or live virus exposure if possible because the consequences to live virus exposure with PERS are so much greater than the consequences to just modified live vaccine. And we don't necessarily see a huge difference in the protection afforded by the antibodies generated either way. Said another way, we don't necessarily see uh, a better immunized animal from giving them vaccine with PERS 
and a wild type virus exposure than just giving them PERS vaccine alone, particularly if we have a PERS stable sow farm, one where we don't have active wild type infections. And I know every situation is unique, so some producers will, will have to do that, but vaccination is critical. And really, we use vaccination as the core of this program to try and minimize the consequences of that pathogen exposure. You've already said that every situation is unique and we've got to be prescriptive, but can you just tell me against which pathogens very generally, please, should we be vaccinating the gilts? When's the right time to vaccinate them? Just If you could just wrap that up very quickly for me. You bet. I'll try and give you kind of some minimum expectations, Peter. Um, for our uh, wiener gilts, uh, circovirus vaccine, and if the herd is mycoplasma positive, mycoplasma vaccine, we'll start those out as wiener gilts, very similar to how we would have commercial pigs vaccinated. We typically like to do an erysiphilis vaccine, Peter. Um, we do that a little bit post weaning. Uh, we worry a little bit more about maternal antibodies if we're doing an injectable uh, erysiphilis vaccine. Um, but we'll typically do that around six to eight weeks of age when we'll do that uh, erysiphilis. And oftentimes, Peter, we'll do the ileitis vaccine at that exact same time. We'll do erysiphilis and, and ileitis together, oftentimes in the water medicator because it's very easy and efficacious to get done between six to eight weeks of age. Then we kind of take a break on our, on our vaccines. Um, and then we move out to the selection time where we go through our gilts at 20 weeks of age and we identify the ones that we want to push forward onto the next step of boar exposure. And we pull off the ones that don't meet our criteria for gilt selection. For the selected gilts, then we start our pre-breeding vaccines. That's gonna be a parvo lepto erysiphilis vaccination program, and we'll generally give two doses of killed vaccines for those pathogens. We'll do a mycoplasma and circovirus booster at that time, Peter, to, to up those antibody levels from the original weaning vaccination. And then we will also do an influenza vaccine. Uh, we'll do a killed influenza vaccine at that time. Again, two doses. And for that in the, the parvo lepto erysiphilis, typically those two doses get split three weeks apart. At that point, we feel like we've got a pretty well immunized animal. Thanks for that summary. And you mentioned right at the start of our conversation about examining, validating, and so on, both the, the health of both the gilts and the herd. Can we go back to that just to say, uh, you know, how often are you testing and what are you testing and what test method? Could you just cover that? What, what, what do you need to be doing to monitor? Yep. So um, I would expect that the, the upstream farm that's shipping me my gilts, if I'm buying gilts, is doing some routine monitoring at a minimum for PERS. And if they're mycoplasma negative, and I expect them to be mycoplasma, I should say naive, also mycoplasma. And I would say at a minimum, I would expect that upstream herd to be monitoring monthly at an absolute minimum. And ideally, I'd like a test result within a week before shipment. Um, you know, with the advent of population-based samples like oral fluids and processing fluids, we can evaluate a large number of animals and get test results in 24 to 48 hours. So I think our ability to monitor those populations is great and it's very reasonable to ask for that sort of testing. In the isolation or quarantine barns, we will clear those animals generally three weeks after they are delivered to our farm. And we will again look for the PERS, for the mycoplasma, for any pathogens that we expect them to be naive for. We'll do a, a combination of PCR and antibody testing on the PERS side, generally just antibody testing on the mycoplasma side. But we'll also throw in some antigen testing or PCR testing for the, the coronaviruses. We'll typically do what we call the swine enteric uh, coronavirus panel, where we'll test for uh, Delta coronavirus, PED virus, and TGE simultaneously. And we'll typically do that on oral fluids. So what'll happen is, Peter, at three weeks post weaning, or three weeks post receiving of those quarantine animals, we'll hang some ropes in those rooms. Uh, that would be kind of the minimum to, to do the PERS PCR, uh, to do the, the swine enteric uh, coronavirus disease PCRs. And then if we do want to look at our antibody status for mycoplasma, we'll have to pull some blood as well. Oh, there you go. Good, well, I'm afraid we have to close this particular podcast but with your permission i'll tell our listeners that we're going to do a second conversation about your development stage and the facilities and the feeding and so on 
but for the moment on guilt acclamation many thanks dr johnson i i have to leave it there for the moment can i say thank you to our listeners and viewers for joining us in this conversation with dr clayton johnson from carthage veterinary services and as you hear we'll have a second meet the expert podcast with him for you shortly for now though thank you goodbye We want to remind you that more information on this conversation, like articles, publications and videos, can be found on the website pers.com.